Hello, I'm Jeremy Vine, and this is Panorama. Imagine your baby is seriously hurt. The radiologist said, a poor little baby, what have you been doing? You've got a broken leg. And you, his parents, are accused. It's social workers' jobs to think the unthinkable because sometimes terrible things happen. It's the nightmare scenario which took this family to the brink. The worst thing for me was my, my powerlessness. Every year, around 20,000 children suspected of being at risk of abuse, neglect or cruelty have their futures decided by the family courts. And the way those courts work is controversial because of strict controls on what can be reported. Judges have the power to remove children from their families and the opinion of expert witnesses is often crucial. Their names are rarely made public. Until now. After a five-year legal battle, Dara McIntyre can finally tell the story of one child, William Ward, and his parents' remarkable fight to open up this closed world. This interview is being tape recorded and may be given in evidence if your case is brought to trial that you were arrested on suspicion of causing grievous bodily harm and child cruelty to your son, William Ward. It's every parent's nightmare. Your beautiful baby is badly hurt, and you're accused of doing it. Did you harm William to the extent of causing this injury? No. William Ward is born at home in the Cambridgeshire village of Cottenham on the 21st of April, 2005. He weighs in at eight pounds 10. He's Jake and Victoria's first child. He's happy, healthy, perfect. His parents couldn't be prouder. It was amazing. It was just great to have him with us, have such a beautiful baby, and a baby who opened his eyes straight away. And yeah, kind of said, hi, mom, and yeah, just, just joined our family, turned Jake and I into a family. Getting to know him as a character and, and him becoming mine, if you like, my son, my boy. Of every day you think to yourself, isn't it great what a privilege it is to have a child. The wards soon settle into their new routine. From really early on, you know, we knew when he was crying because he was hungry or needed a nappy change or was tired. Um, so really easy to kind of match, match his cries to his needs. But one night, when William is three months old, his cries are different. He woke up with quite a sharp cry and went up to him and tried to feed him. And he wasn't really interested in milk, which was unheard of. And that continued throughout the night. His parents don't know it, but their lives are about to change forever. There was obviously something amiss with William. But, you know, we didn't at that time know what it was or, or how serious it was. They take him to the doctor in the morning. William's given the all clear, but later one of his legs appears swollen. And I called Jake and asked him to have a look and Jake wasn't sure that he could see it. So we, we didn't do anything. Jake took him upstairs for his bath. And then Jake called me and said, yeah, you're right. If you look at him in the bath, he's not kicking that leg. They go back to the doctors twice more, but there's still no diagnosis. Our minds were running all over the place with, you know, what could possibly be wrong with William. And, you know, we didn't know, the doctors didn't know. On day three, William is taken to Addenbrooke's hospital in Cambridge. I was the only one allowed in and laid him down and he had an X-ray and very quickly the radiologist said, poor little baby, what have you been doing? You've got a broken leg. And I was just absolutely shocked. The X-ray reveals a spiral fracture of the lower right leg. 
it's an extremely rare injury in a child not yet walking. William's parents are asked for an explanation. They don't have one. We were told to sit in a cubicle. The curtains were drawn. We had, you know, hurried, whispered conversations from behind the curtains. And that's when it really started to go downhill fast. Faced with a seriously injured child and no explanation, it's hospital protocol to call in social services. Hang on, they're saying that this is suspicious and therefore we as William's parents are, are going to be under suspicion. The atmosphere changed around us. The way we were being treated by the nurses, by the doctors. William is x-rayed from head to toe. There's even worse news for the wards. A senior radiologist reports three more fractures, as well as signs of injuries to both his arms. It's evidence that William may have been abused several times in his short life. This nightmare seemed like it was, it was just completely spiralling out of control. I think having a child with a fracture is bad enough, being accused of something is bad enough, and then I think your, your next worst nightmare is, is that that the accusations are, are going to grow and grow and grow. The police, along with social workers from Cambridgeshire County Council, interview the wards at the hospital. You are now the suspect. We were now the suspects, yeah. William's leg, which doesn't need a cast, begins to heal naturally. But he's now under the watch of the child protection system. It was a clear-cut case in that there was no immediate explanation and the parents were, were not clear how the baby had come by the injury. Unfortunately, it's social workers' jobs to think the unthinkable because sometimes terrible things happen. William's injuries are suspected to be non-accidental. That could mean child abuse. Social workers have to decide if he should be taken into care. Because his parents don't appear to fit the profile of child abusers, an unusual plan is devised. William can go home with his mom and dad, but on one condition, he must never be left alone with them. Jake and Victoria have to be supervised 24 seven by William's grandparents. They agreed to move from Devon. William moves to their bedroom. Effectively, we jump through hoops or, or anything at all just to keep him with his parents. Poor Jake would have to have this dragon of a mother-in-law standing over him, literally, while he changed the baby's nappy. I mean, it just used to break our heart. William. There was not a second when we actually left him alone or, or whatever. We were always there, and it meant that whatever activities were happening with William, either Catherine, myself, or both of us, would have to be there. You were policing your daughter? Yes, absolutely. Literally. We, we were jailers. And, and Jake. Yeah, we, we were their jailers. Dad. Oh, no. Social workers monitor them closely. Then the wards are called to a police station. They're under arrest. You were arrested on suspicion of causing grief, bodily harm, and child cruelty to your son, William Ward. The minute that we, we heard that we were being arrested, when those words were spoken to us, I think we both separately thought, actually, are, are we going to get out of this police station? If you're going to go into a cell, you're going to take your shoes off, you're going to take your belt off, you can't have mm. shoelaces and all this sort of thing, handing over all your belongings and very much being treated like a criminal. Detectives are looking for motive. Is there anything sort of medically that would give cause for concern, you know, sort of postnatal depression or anything? Oh, with like that me? No. I was so happy to get pregnant. They're released on bail, but they are now at the centre of a criminal investigation. The wards both work for Cambridgeshire County Council, the very same local authority which is also investigating them. He's an IT, she's a manager in childcare strategy. Both are suspended immediately. They've gone from being proud first-time parents to suspected child abusers. A week later, it's made official. The local authority puts William on the child protection register. The worst thing for me was effectively, in my mind, taking away part of William's childhood 
for me as a father. My role, you know, father-son relationship with William at the time, how I felt about what was being done to us and the family, and sort of my my powerlessness. The only way out of their nightmare is to find an explanation for William's injuries. They have a theory about his cot. It was right next to their bed. The family take photographs and detailed measurements. They also install a CCTV camera to film William while he sleeps. What we think may have happened is that William caught his foot between the cot bars and our mattress, got it firmly stuck, um, and because he was a very determined and very um, very strong little baby, m pulled and pulled to free his trapped leg, and that as he did that, caused this, this twisting fracture. Detectives remove the cot. The ward search the internet for other possible answers. We'd looked up spiral fractures, we'd looked up um, swollen leg, we'd looked up all sorts of things to try and see if we could get answers for ourselves. Then an apparent breakthrough. Victoria discovers a condition called hypermobility. That's double jointedness. A rheumatologist tells her it could explain William's injuries. We thought we finally might have a, a proper cogent answer for what had happened. What have you got there, Wills? Their optimism is short-lived. Days later, in December 2005, Cambridgeshire County Council applies for a care order. This throws them into the secret world of the family courts, a world where everything now happens behind closed doors and where nothing can be reported. This is where William's future will be decided and it could end with him being taken from them. We were incredibly worried. We'd been warned by family after family that a hearing would go against us, that we would be found to be responsible because family courts work on the balance of probabilities um, and on the balance of probabilities, people tend to find that, that parents have inflicted an injury because that's thought to be what's more likely. The secrecy of the family courts is intended to protect the privacy of children, but many parents complain that the rules which, if broken, can mean prison, are unfair to them. I think the very first family that we spoke to stressed the secrecy of the family courts. They risked being in contempt of court and shared with us information that they felt we needed to know, um, but that officially we, we couldn't know. The wards now face the prospect of two court battles, one in the family court, the second in the criminal court, which could see them jailed. The police case appears to rely on evidence from two doctors, a community paediatrician who tells them that William's injuries were most likely to have been inflicted. And a radiologist who gives a devastating diagnosis. William has four fractures and has been injured on at least two separate occasions. In July 2006, the wards are questioned again. Detectives focus on the most serious fracture. One of the medical reports suggests that a way for this injury to have occurred is the deliberate inflicting of pain by twisting of the joint or snapping or bending of the joint. Did you do that with William? No. The wards are fighting for their future together. As the family court case draws nearer, Victoria starts a video diary. I can't explain how it makes you feel. When we first found out that we were being accused of hurting William, I just felt sick. And I felt sick for months. So we had to just let that go and, and move on and accept that our life was as suspected child abusers. You know, we don't put ourselves in situations where we're around lots of children in our village even. Um, because if we ever do get charged and if the news ever does get out, I don't want people saying, <gasps> Those people touched my children. The ward home is like a pressure cooker. William's grandparents are still on guard duty. It is like being a teenager. Your parents have the run of the house. 
and it puts a lot of strain on our relationship with them because with the best will in the world, we don't want them here. For Jake and Victoria, the social workers are even more intrusive. We're now on our third social work team and our fifth social worker. Um, the, the second team just didn't have the staff to be able to cope with visiting us that often, which to us was really frightening because that meant that we must be the most dangerous family in Cambridgeshire. The most ordinary of family dramas comes with the threat of catastrophe. William woke up this morning, bless him, with uh, a great big bruise on his leg. He'd been running around at his child minders, I think. And it's crazy because we didn't want social services to see it. So this morning we had a visit first thing in the morning and I changed William out of his shorts and I put long trousers on him. And I, I hate that. I hate the fact that I felt I had to do that. In September 2006, 14 months after they were first accused of abuse, they get some unexpected news. CPS, Crown Prosecution Service, have decided not to continue with our case and not to take any further action, which means that the criminal case is now closed. Potato. Detectives still believe yeah. someone harmed William, but they can't prove who. Jake and Victoria hope that social services, who are by now relaxing their monitoring, will drop their case against them too. They don't. Why didn't you, at this stage, take into consideration, one, the police action, and two, the fact that your own social workers must have been reporting to you that there were no issues at home? Because it was felt that it was a matter, um, such was the complexity of the issue and the range of medical opinion, that it was a matter for court determination. That same month, the family is back in Addenbrooke's hospital. This time we weren't there for anything connected with William. We were there because of this. We were having a scan taken of our new baby. Do you want to listen? Can you hear the heartbeat? Baby. 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 Obviously our big concern is that we have to inform social services about this. Um, and having heard stories where other couples have had to flee the country to give birth and other people have had children taken away from them. It's not an easy thing that we have to do. Victoria is five months pregnant when the family court hearing starts in Cambridge in October. The future of William and their unborn child is at stake. I try and just get through the day in court really. I try not to think why am I here and how am I here? I sit with one of my favourite photos of William in front of me and I just look at that and remind myself that that's why we're going through this. It's hard when we sit there and, you know, have people talking about how we would have done it if we'd broken his leg and how we would have grabbed him and, um, you know, what we would have been thinking when we did it. The court must decide what happened to William. It appoints five medical experts to help. The wards have high hopes for one of them, the rheumatologist, who claims hypermobility or double jointedness might explain William's injuries. His evidence crumbles under cross-examination. He was forced to concede that some of the, the points that he was making are not backed up by research papers or by evidence. They're backed up by his 15 years of experience of seeing hypermobile patients. Um, but no, there isn't anything in writing that can back this up. That leaves the family's theory that William injured himself in his cot. The judge has shown their footage of baby William asleep. The judge watched this twice this morning and that was really helpful because she was able to see exactly what, what, what funny movements he makes in his sleep and how much he moved, even with a sort of a healing broken leg. The medical experts agree it's possible, but unlikely. For the first time, there is consensus on William's injuries. His arms weren't hurt after all. The police expert who said William had suffered four fractures on at least two occasions is wrong. William had two fractures and they probably happened at the same time. The hearing lasts seven days. The wards are desperate for a quick judgment, but weeks pass and they hear nothing. So we got home about lunchtime. Um, to find that Jake had 
collapsed, Jake had had some kind of anxiety attack and he couldn't move. He'd blacked out and he couldn't move. When I saw him, when I got back into the house, I thought he'd had a heart attack. And I would like somebody to tell me how this is helping me, how this is helping Jake, how this is helping William, and how this is helping our unborn baby. William, now nearly 20 months old, has no idea of the tension that is gripping his parents. Finally, in the first week of December, a hurried phone call from a solicitor with the barest of detail. I can't really believe it. We're not allowed to see the judgment, except for one paragraph, the 96th paragraph, which apparently said something like, there is no cogent evidence um, of non-accidental injury, and I'm not satisfied that the significant harm that William suffered was due to any action on the part of his parents. And, um, yeah, that's supposed to be good news, and it's supposed to mean that it's over, but... I think we need somebody to tell us that. It's not just good news, it's exceptional. William is removed from the Child Protection Register. Social services end their involvement with the family. It's very rare that family court cases conclude so decisively. The judge said there was no cogent evidence that the parents had inflicted the injury. We were right to intervene because there was a serious injury to a baby for which there was no immediate rational explanation. How can you celebrate knowing that someone has decided you didn't hurt your child when all along you've known that you didn't hurt your child? When Jake and Victoria finally get to see the full judgment, they know what's important. But because of the secrecy of the family courts, they can't tell anyone what's in it they go to the High Court in London to ask for it to be made public. We felt it was our responsibility, really, to keep making this more public and to do what we possibly could to, to chip away at the secrecy of the family courts to help all of those other families that are out there still going through what we went through. In a highly significant move, the court orders the judgment be published. It reveals that great weight was given to evidence from a paediatrician who said that it's wrong to assume child abuse just because there's no other explanation for an injury. This is crucial for other families. It's not just a case of, yes, they abused the child, or no, they didn't abuse the child, that there can be grey areas. For the wards, this is only a partial victory. They want all reporting restrictions lifted, allowing them to name everyone involved in the case. It's the medical experts they're most keen to identify. Secrecy means that families, they can't find out exactly what to expect about what will go on in court. Um, they, they can't share experiences. They can't adequately prepare themselves for what's going to happen in terms of making sure that they have the necessary experts and evidence that they need to be making their case. Medical experts are named in criminal cases. The evidence of Professor Roy Meadow helped to convict Sally Clark and Angela Cannings of murdering their children. His expert opinion was undermined when both women were later freed on appeal. To help guard against miscarriages of justice in the family courts, a leading media barrister says experts should be identified there too. If these experts are going to be relied on in cases which often involve critical questions as to whether or not children should be taken away from their families, then I think uh, the very least that should be expected is that those experts ought to be prepared uh, to be publicly identified and for their work to be subjected to public scrutiny. Victoria, now mom of two, returns to the High Court for one final battle. The wards versus Addenbrooke's Hospital, Cambridgeshire County Council and the experts represented by the Medical Defence Union. They all argue that lifting anonymity will not help protect children. It's the medical experts who put up the biggest fight. They're supported in court by evidence from a fellow expert witness. The worry here is that sharing the names of experts who are giving evidence is going to lead to some of those experts ending up as the target of a campaign by a group of parents who are all involved in child protection proceedings. And this can lead to professional harassment 
and not only be damaging to that paediatrician, but will deter other paediatricians from being involved in similar work. The case is heard by Lord Justice Munby. It takes three years for it to run its course, but when it ends, it does so with a legal landmark. Expert witnesses, in fact, just about all witnesses, can be named. It was highly significant. This is the first case uh, in which uh, evidence has been put before the court from experts. That evidence was rejected by the court as insufficient as a basis for preserving anonymity. And it's this judgment which allows Panorama to tell this story tonight and which allows us to finally name the expert witnesses who got it wrong. Dr. Carl Johnson, the police expert whose evidence suggested a history of abuse. His conclusions were rejected by the court. Dr. David Vickers, the community paediatrician who told police that without an explanation, the likely cause of William's injury was that it was inflicted. The judge did not accept this argument. Professor Howard Bird, the rheumatologist who suggested hypermobility. The judge found that he had failed to be guided by a duty of professional detachment. One expert, though, was singled out for praise by the court. Paediatrician Professor Tim David, who said an unexplained injury doesn't always mean child abuse.